give us wisdom about who we are, where we are, and where we're going. And so I just presented this picture, the, whether it's out of Africa and how many years these uh, numbers and arrows have been changed, but we've been out and about, and by the time we got out here in Siberia, I've been in Kamchatka, and Amanita Muscari has been referred to, but there's a lot of other things that are out there, not necessarily all um, psychoactive, like giant bears. But in any case, going across and coming in, we're experienced hunters, and we've gone through many different environments, all the way down to Tierra del Fuego by 10,000 years ago, and in each of those ecosystems, discovering the, the, um, the mushrooms, the fungus, in the Northwest, for example, and then moving down in Daturas and in the Mediterranean environments, and then the cactus, the peyote in the desert, the high desert, and uh, eventually the, the other, the tall columnar San Pedro, and then into down all the way to Tierra del Fuego. And most of these societies found plants that could alter their consciousness and they could speak with their ancestors, which ties the culture together. Kava is uh, where it's used in a sacred sense, and it used to be mostly restricted to those that were either high ranking or the kahuna. Kahuna means ka the huna secret. And so if you're an ethnobotanical uh, holder of the secrets, you'd be kahuna la'au, lapa'au. And they had others that were uh, specialists and super knowledgeable about building canoes or uh, speaking with the ancestors. So. The archaeological evidence, I would suggest, is almost pan-global, if you will, tradition of psychoactive drug plant use. And uh, this is a, in one of the smallest islands in the Pacific and still so isolated that it's still relatively, um, not pristine, but very much not all that long ago, just still wearing breech cloths or um, malo. But this is Antikopia, and this is the goddess of Ghazi we'll get back to. And that was sent to me when I was doing my research back in the 70s by a forest botanist for the Forest Service, and those were in preservative, and they were dated to five, four and a half to 5,000. Now it's probably pushed back even further to about 5,500 year old seeds of, uh, in an anaerobic condition where a lot of them were found in the Swiss forelands. We'll get to that. So uh, what about the this uh, so-called um, scientific perspective of archaeobotany uh, and combined with archaeological science. Identification and interpretation. Is this really represent the opium poppy? And how about those carnelian um, objects here? I should use the laser beam, but I wanted to move a little bit to get going and see if I can use that laser beam. You know, when people give a lecture and they use a laser beam, they start out when they talk to the audience, they're moving it around. And people, you know, go on, it gets an altered state going there. But, <laughs> oh, that breaks it up when you laugh. You wake up, because my mumbleism and my monotone can put you to sleep. So if you're back there and it's, you know, shake your hand and say, stop mumbling, Merlin. Okay, <laughs> seriously, now I'm talking to myself. Okay, my macrofossils and microfossils. In, it's no small um, coincidence that they're either in very dry areas or waterlogged areas, and also areas where there's been academic uh, interest in science or scholarly development at uh, institution. In other words, much in the European uh, mode. Uh, and so we might say, why are the studies in some of the remote parts of Eurasia, including Southeast Asia, did they really not have any uh, much use of uh, psychoactive substances? Well, certainly they had beetle nuts for, uh, through, and that spread far and wide. How do we date these uh, fossils, whether they're macro or micro, from pollen and uh, spores in the micro sense to macro seeds and capsules and parts of plants, et cetera? And if you're an ethnobiologist, ethnozoologist, you'll be interested in fossils and bones, et cetera. So we'll get back to some of the evidence that's shown here uh, as we move along. Okay. So we're going to be looking at ephedra. Uh, also known as Mahawang in China, widely known and widely used for thousands of years. Uh, and we'll start with that example, ancient use of ephedra. So ephedra, there's about 60 to 70 species, roughly 65. It, it changes with splitting and lumping. So throughout much of the same kind of environment, high, dry, desert environments or arid environments. Not all, some stretch into it moderately moist, but basically it's an ancient plant. They're gymnosperms. They're older than the flowering plants. They open 
seeded plants, the gymnosperms, as opposed to angiosperms, closed so seeded or fruiting plants. So uh, it's about 65 of them. And uh, as a bronchial dilator or decongestant, they've been important for a long time. And they're in the high dry deserts where you get wind. In the case of Western China to uh, Central China, you got winds blowing from the Gobi Desert that actually blow all over the, across the uh, Pacific Ocean and drop out when there's lulls in the wind speed. And that has been shown by ecologists Vitusik and his lab and uh, others, that that makes a significant increment in the soils of, say, Kauai, which is five million years old, which makes it able to grow some of the same species that grow in the Big Island. We have relatively young soils of varying age, but it's the dropout of that dust. That dust in human lungs can be problematic. And so the teas or uh, decoctions, uh, infusions of ephedra, and uh, in a brilliant talk this morning by Shaheen about um, the, what is the HOMA, at first from SOMA, I think these things have changed. Again, as we snip the information and move on to a new area, but we remember these crucial keystone species, like the ones that put us in touch with the gods or who were, may have been originally the ancestors, our parents or grandparents or on and on and on, and eventually be deified in uh, at least some cultures. Okay, so. Uh, Central Asia is where I'll focus, and let's go to the Shanandar Cave, and that is in the Zagros Mountains, spectacular setting, and you can see the uh, map on the right, the, the red arrow points to the general area. It's northern Iraq, actually the uh, Kurdistan uh, anonymous area, anatomous area if I'm mispronouncing it, but Shanandar Cave in a limestone formation, and you get like the cavernous, large caverns uh, due to solution from the rainfall, which is mildly acidic, and he forms these cave complexes which are used in various parts of the world, in the case of Polynesia and Micronesia, uh, where they have raised reef or makatea, and some of these used for, to hide away bones or burial. And it turns out that somewhere between 50 and 70,000 years ago, uh, this was uh, occupied by Neanderthals based on the skeletal uh, uh, morphology and then the genetic information. So what we know is, that say about 50,000 years ago, well, one of the burials, uh, the Selekis who in the 50s were learning new techniques and modern science was uh, coming into play in many of the uh, different disciplines, including archeology span and anthropology and geography and biology, et cetera. And uh, they decided to collect samples around this one burial, flex burial, pointed in the same direction often, indicating some kind of ritualization and an advanced thinking, if, we, if you will. In any case, these were sent to a palynologist, a leading palynologist worked at the museum of, uh, Natural Museum in Paris, and she came back with the information for the Selecchis. This is, she said, this is amazing. You've got eight bunches here of pollen, and they're from the same species in each uh, <clears throat> deposit. And she said, there's seven of the eight of them are med used medicinally in the region as traditional medicinal plants in the region today. And she said, um, this, they were the bunches, like taking, this is 50,000 years ago with the people who were characterized early on as, you know, and still are, well, you look at me walk, I might be like that sometimes. And one of the species was ephedra. The, the identification is ephedra. And, uh, so, it was ex the title of the Selecki book after years of excavating and putting it all together, it was The First Flower People. And in the early 70s when the book was published that was writing on the change that w much of what has inspired uh, your interest in it over the last 50 years. So, then there was of course in science skepticism, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's look at that, uh, maybe gerbils or rodents that burrow underneath have moved this stuff around. And so that added a, a kind of a cautionary, which is there's no final truth in science. That's one of the reasons it's effective, whether you don't like reductionist points of view of science, it's effective, it keeps us open, open mind about our convictions based on our observations or even our speculations. So, uh, then just in a couple of years ago, uh, They've discovered another burial away from the original 10 that they had excavated. So this was an occupied living in shelter, but also a burial, but in certain, they had like their own cemetery within the cave. They discovered 
another one which had been covered by part of the ceiling in probably an earthquake uh, broke the part of the ceiling and it covered this other burial. They just pulled that apart recently and they found they did some uh, soil sampling and there's some flowers involved there. And th the publication is so recent after, uh, that they, the full analysis of the species and the verification hasn't been uh, come up yet. But it's still an open question, but it, I think not. It certainly isn't uh, conclusive, but it gives us some idea that people, even in, before our so-called anatomically modern species of Homo sapiens, by the way, Homo sapiens, wise humans, are we really? I was thinking Homo extinctor, but, uh, <laughs> Or Homo economicus is what Carl uh, Sauer suggested. In any case, so ephedra alone or combined may have even been the source of Homo and Soma. When I finished my master's degree on uh, cannabis, uh, I was really just at finishing it up and, and had a contract to make it into a book. I wrote to Dick Schultes, Dr. Richard Schultes, uh, Evan Schultes, what do you think about cannabis being part of the Soma? You know, and I read or found it in OpenStax. What a wonderful thing in the, one of the UCLA big research undergraduate library. And I'm looking through it. And I found a little pamphlet darkened by the, the, the kind of the quality of the paper written by a, an, an Indian citizen or a scholar. And he made the case for cannabis as Shaheen made the case possibly for Pergamum. Or I may, tried to make the case, not necessarily that I believe it's ephedra, but I said, we've got to consider it alone or in combination. And if you're talking about combination to change your, or uh, dealing with survival uh, or altered state, think of what Jonathan uh, Liu in his brilliant presentation, remember the jar with the five very toxic animals in there? Shake it up, take it down, and it's a woo plant. It might be good, it might be bad. I I'm, uh, I'm, hope I'm not balderizing that, but it, what is in there? Often. The, uh, farm, the herbalists will put something they know is the active thing and other things in there to camouflage so that their, their power, their mana, that's from an objective point of view uh, of being skeptical or critical of, about it, but it's worth considering and there's been a lot of study on from that perspective. Revered in ancient religious associations in some places or in some situations like the Rig Vedic tradition, which came out of Central Asia, <laughs> into India about 3,500 years ago, and out of which comes the uh, Vedic tradition, Vedanta, Hinduism, eventually a branch of where you don't have to be in the highest class. You don't have to go through samsara or the wheel of over and over again to justify the, uh, the highest level, a Brahmin. You can go whatever level you are. You can even be a warring, uh, leading warrior king like uh, Gautama Siddhartha. Uh, and uh, so there rise of Buddhism, which not necessarily with psychoactive substance, me meditation is another way of breaking on through to the other side. By the way, my father, who I mentioned, had a book collection. I found these little books, and they were um, Heaven and Hell and The Doors of Perception. He had reviewed them in the 50s. And when my mother would take me a couple blocks from where we lived in Hollywood up to the market, the one that she liked, and one day we were in there, and. This is my mother, who was a writer, too, with my father. And she said, Mark, over there, picking the tomatoes. And he was looking really close. He had his eyeglasses pushed up. That's Aldous Huxley. Oh, Aldous who? And anyways, later at a track meet that I went to, indoor track meet in Los Angeles, my dad pointed out, up there, is, that's Aldous Huxley that's sitting up there. Brave New World came out. He wanted to read about it in that special Soma-like featured in that book. So. Meanwhile, this is a site that maybe some of you know more about than I do, uh, the Gunner Temple, or Gunner Temple inside this BMAC, which I'll mention a uh, moment. That's the Bactria Margiana Archaeological Complex. It's a relatively large area here in Central Asia, south, southern part, uh, actually within a number of different uh, countries, parts of it. It uh, stretches from uh, across from near the Caspian Sea underneath or south of the what used to be the ROC. I want you to notice two things. It's a broad area which has a similar um, complex and it was uh, urbanized about 4,000 years ago or earlier, starting the urbanization. And right here, I'll come back to the, if I get that far, hopefully, Pamir Mountains. Just a couple of years ago, 
they found the smoking gun for the connection of cannabis and humans. I'm sure you're excited to hear about that, but uh, we'll see if we get there. So the Bactria Margiana complex. Dr. Syria Nidi, who's a Greek-Russian archaeologist, uh, was the leader of the team that excavated the major temple in which they found an extraordinary, uh, what he thinks is a ritual area. They pre prepared a mixed sort of uh, a drink, which could have been the soma or, or a, a special kind of psychoactive drink. Um, this is the area of today, more or less, in a photograph. There's what it could have been the urban area. Apparently, there's fighting. They got a defensive wall there. And there's the important room inside the complex, the temple, and the, the big boiler there, or pot, was where they f apparently supposedly found, he reported, dishes with cannabis, poppy, and ephedrine, is the way he termed it. And uh, I'd like somebody else to know more about this, let me know. Uh, but that mixture together kind of ties all three of the species that I'm talking about. Hmm, that's weird. Uh, and these are just some of the implements he suggested, for instance, that the, these imprints here, and then compared it with present uh, day cannabis seeds, match up. Uh, there's some, depth, obviously, scientific skepticism about that. And uh, Dr. Chakomet, who's well known in the field, thinks they may or may not, they could have been another seed, but they're, uh, they're not super large, so they're not uh, artificially selected to the point of some of the Chinese seeds, which are sold in bags at the common markets uh, around in rural China today for a snack food like uh, sunflower seeds. So in any case, uh, we're moving forward. Let's look at China and the use of ephedra there, since that's probably most well known. As you can see in the dots here, there's several different, or the nine species that are uh, listed there. And not all of them are associated with the name Ma Huang. So, Mahuang, or yellow or bitter golden cannabis. The name for cannabis, which has was, was, been a medicinal plant for, who knows, at least 5,000 years. Uh, recent publication, just in the last year or two, uh, 120,000 seeds of cannabis found in this area, along with medical texts. It probably was an herbalist in the tradition of what we call today Chinese herbal medicine. 120,000 seeds connected with actual written records uh, that associate the plant, and that's a, a new publication that came out this year. So uh, ephedrine, yes, you make teas out of it. Maybe it isn't pressed, but they may press it to get more of the moisture out. Maybe that was a technique that's been snipped off or uh, no longer is with us. So there is a, one of the ways it's represented in traditional Chinese uh, ideograms. And by the way, I should have gone back to that. I get lost here. Um, just to point out, this is Ma, and this is the bitter or golden. If I'm not mistaken, Jonathan will correct me. And you see the two plants, male and female, hanging here in a shed to dry. That's the uh, ideogram, traditional Chinese writing for Ma, Damatsi, the great Ma. And then there are other Ma, which is, and it's a tonal language, so I may be mispronouncing Ma, but uh, the bitter or golden, so it's Ma Huang is up there and relates to the Great Ma. So you see here these two plants are related in traditional China, Chinese uh, herbalism, uh, if not in other uh, aspects of its use for visionary quest, etc. So there are other species. I'll just show some of these with some of the information you can't read, but I just wanted to impress you with the scientific information. Uh, but notice this one is Ephedra, I got to just use this, Ephedra esquitina, a synonym for that, it's, most people accept this name now, is Shenung. Guiana, Shenung, if you remember in Jonathan's talk, was the first the legendary emperor and the divine hus uh, farmer and uh, experimented with 365, or at least new 365 plants that, that were used, including ephedra and including cannabis, et cetera. So other species, uh, Gera, Gerardiana, is grown and is a potent one. And uh, this is... Um, yeah, high mountain dries in southwest China. You can find it, by the way, in high mountains in the southwest of the U.S., around the Grand Canyon, a uh, species called um, Ephedra viridis, which is known commonly as Mormon tea, or squaw tea, or excuse the uh, whorehouse tea. 
hmm, uh, it's a strong stimulant. And of course, it's association with Mormons who are not allowed to have psychoactive substances. Now, some chocolate and ephedrine, please, or Mormon tea. Uh, no offense to those, but uh, that's perhaps not understanding that that's the, psych the psychoactivity that we have just indulged in having some coffee and tea uh, alters our consciousness. If it's only thinking, wake it up, but making us alert, and ephedrine plays that role, uh, and in fact, cleaning out our lungs and dealing with asthmatic or other problems with respir respiratory problems. So the main one it's associated with, that is Mahawang, is with ephedra sinica, or the Chinese ephedra. And the alkaloids include a number of different alkaloids. What most one that's uh, known about or demonized is ephedrin. For the popular aspects of it, in the whole units that are made into and sold in um, herbal stores today, Mahawang and or ephedra. And there's a picture of one of the typical plants. It's a strange, small shrub, but it's ancient. It's its only species in its um, genera. I mean, there's many in the, gen uh, in the genera, but only genus in its family uh, is still around. So it's highly adaptable and found in all across the globe. Part of that, of course, is plate tectonics. But the, this is a picture which I thought was kind of interesting. He's being handed, that's Shenung, represented here. And Shenung is being handed um, ephedra. And you have other things here. Cannabis isn't shown here, but it's one of the deadly nightshades. Uh, the Tura species or Hyascoma species uh, or Mandragora species. And here you have perhaps a Mandragora, another Solanaceous species, and other species represented by this author. By the way, when I saw people using these, and I said, are those bongs, large bongs? <laughs> and they're actually for tobacco uh, used today in rural markets. You'll see three or four men over in a corner, and they're inhaling from this, these units here. I had a person call me after my book on marijuana was published long ago. And uh, he, I picked up the phone. It was a local uh, male voice I interpreted. He said, hey, professor, you tell me how to make one bong. And I said, uh, what do you mean? No, 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 you're a professor. Tell me how you make one bong. And I said, uh, I think you're referring to my association with this book. That's a scholarly book. Oh, come on. You know the kind. What's the matter? Oh, we, oui, bro. Can I tell me how to make one bong? <laughs> I woke you up again. <laughs> Mark did that too, effectively. Uh, I don't know how effective mine is. Anyways, back to sleep. Pen Sao, uh, <laughs> documenting uh, the incredible knowledge of this first emperor. So he was maybe a kahuna la'au, la'pa'au, as the Hawaiians would say, but he was also uh, got his peoples organized and took over other kingdoms to become an emperor at least within the range at, in those days, perhaps about four to 5,000 years ago. A lot of people use this dates published. It's a problem with using secondary sources of 2700 BC is when he was there. And that's different calculations and an average for when Shenung was in power and left his uh, mark, no pun intended here, of uh, herbalism and the tradition of knowledge which is passed on and, and China's unique in that way having this not only the long-running medical record but now an acceleration of archaeological work such as this here that uh, was discovered and then uh, excavated and analyzed and this publication in 1997 shows the identifications of the oldest example at that time of ephedra through anatomical evidence and active biomarkers through gas chromatography and a protocol which provided it with significant information on the use of ephedra. Now what's interesting for this one was there was quite a bit of the bodies they looked at in the cemetery. All of them had a placed upon the right, actually in the cleft between your height of your shoulder bone and your breastbone, laid on the right hand side, a little like packet of the stems of ephedra. And this may have been a plague or the people that died because of asthma, asthma over time due to their exposure in this very dry area uh, here of, whoops, <laughs> sorry, hit the wrong button. Um, up in this region here, this is Xinjiang. It's the driest uh, 
Some of the world's most difficult deserts are located in this area, but there are oases here and there, and people have thrived in those all the way from where, not so far from north of Shenandoah, uh, Shenandoah Cave in the Zagros, all the way up to, to uh, Siberia, Siberia, or eventually Mongolia, and et cetera. So, uh, here we go. And so the analysis, morphological analysis and, and uh, identification is with uh, ephedra. And a more recent study by someone that I've worked with, I'll show you a few of our discoveries in cannabis, and I'm going to move faster now to catch up. Jiang, uh, and that's Honin Jiang, who's an uh, uh, archaeobotanist at the um, Academy of Sciences in Beijing. And that's, in fact, uh, Jiang right here. And this site, they found evidence of ephedra shown here, along with some of the plants that were grown in the oasis associated with that generally dry area surrounding it, and that's wheat, triticum, hordium, barley, um, millet, panicum, and uh, some other plants, including ephedra, as you see uh, in the yellow highlighting. Now, in modern times, we know that Mahawang has been sold, and often it's sometimes called ephedra sinica in several names, and most of us have taken a decongestant, and for a long time, and right up to today, it often has a, a ephedrine in it. And in fact, today, if you buy ephedrine at Wall uh, Greens or another place uh, where they're following the rules, the, the drug uh, enforcement rules, you have to list uh, and take a note of who the people are and how much of the ephedrine they're making because it can be easily converted to methamphetamine. And so, but lots of uh, uses for losing weight conditioning the body, and of course, as a decongestant in things like Sudafed. Uh, but over the past few decades, ephedra has been, of course, as most of you know, in the uh, crack houses, and we're going some decades now, the importance of uh, this illicit manufacturing and sales and the dangers that are involved with it. So that's on the horrific side. But it's, when used as a, uh, it, for thousands of years, it gave, assumingly, great relief to people as we know it can in terms of bronco, uh, bronchodilation, uh, et cetera. And so the problems of shifting and the making of crystal meth uh, methamphetamine in the synthesis, relatively easy to do. So I'm going to move on to the opium poppy and uh, the archetypical narcotic and put you to sleep permanently if you take too much. So it's going to be dangerous. We'll come back to the uh, goddess of agriculture, Demeter, the Romans called Ceres, coming up. And so, you know, there are many different papaver uh, poppies, papaver and other genera in the family of poppies, a couple hundred species in papaveraceae or more, but none is prized as the opium poppy, which is multi-purpose. Uh, <clears throat> Plant made the seeds are rich in uh, vegetable fat and protein, and they're mixed in traditional, like Eastern European uh, delicacies like moan cake here and, uh, and used to uh, spice up, quote unquote, uh, a muffin, uh, muffin here. And these are produced in the seed, seed capsules. But they're also used for uh, ornamentation. I remember Claire and I, we bought one in, in England that had been painted gold and uh, it was uh, in a small uh, secondhand shop and sold and so bought that. It lasted for another 10 years before the termites in Hawaii got to it. Uh, the key substance is produced in the, the um, uh, mesocarp, in between the outer part of the skin or the capsule itself, the exocarp and the uh, endocarp, is a section that these vessels grow and develop into surrounding that, and then the liquid or sap is spread around that, but only when it's maturing and growing, when it f reaches maturity and it's fer the, the um, seeds are fertilized, then it dries out and can be pecked by a bird or knocked back and forth in the wind to di disperse the seeds. So it's the immature poppies that are uh, extracted by very carefully slicing it. So it doesn't drip in and ruin the seeds, but it drips out and then collected, uh, cut in the morning and collected in the afternoon when it turns dark color. That's important in the archaeobotany. So I'm going to move ahead here. You can see the uh, it's already the white sap. And notice those are lines, parallel lines. So the first, archaeologically, we see the, there's evidence of the first uh, 
cutting by a special tool with the inset of a little knife-like structure inside a piece of wood so you couldn't go farther than just a slight bit of say a razor edge and that way you'd cut appropriately deep to get it to seep outside. Then putting several of those blades together is an advanced <laughs> technological advancement because this is back-breaking work, bending over and scraping to, and then collecting. And that's why it's done uh, where the, the labor is cheapest and it ends up being in rural areas and smuggled out of whether it's today rural Mexico or Colombia, but for a long time it was the golden triangle of northern mountainous uh, Southeast Asia. And before that it had been in large plantations in India by the British and then taken and sold to uh, people out of work in coastal towns like Guangzhou, used to be called Canton, et cetera, and we had the opium den proliferation and the uh, tried to su suppression of the Chinese government at the time to stop that, uh, and then the British Navy responding and uh, getting the uh, lease on, if you will, on Hong Kong and the outer, the new islands or new territories for up until it was recently given back to the ruling powers of China, or the Chinese. In any case, it was in 1753 that Linnaeus was the first to classify the sleeping poppy, gave it that name, uh, the only species of papaver used to produce opium. And there are a few others that produce morphine, some have produced something close to codeine, but there's many different alkaloids and many of them are used, but only the opium or the morphine produced in papaver somniferum of all those poppies. Interestingly, the role of ephedrine in many ways, with, whether it's modern drugs or poppies in terms of science, the birth of pharmacology starts with this uh, a uh, young man at the time that he discovered, he's a little older in that picture, and this Mr. Saturner got a job with a um, pharmacist or druggist in uh, uh, Batterporn, a town in Germany, and he was assigned to be the assistant working in the back and trying to, with the, he was taught by the druggist, you'd use these chemicals and you can extract this from that and then put these things. So he, he was making the, well, uh, the solutions and the, that were infused with opium as well as others and was very popular in the U.S. or the uh, states at that time as well as in Germany throughout Europe and sold in small bottles like Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrups for uh, crying babies who were having problems with teeth coming out or a, a, a lot of higher percentage of women and men were drinking these solutions and that's another story, historic story. In any case, morphine, codeine, sabine, narcotine, etc. All of these main f six alkaloids, except for thebine, are used for uh, medicinal uses directly. But it's thebine that uses the base to make uh, these synthetic uh, other types of opioids, uh, generally speaking. Now, uh, we'll just quickly look at some of the origins of the poppy and the hypo uh, hypothesis about its cultural connection with uh, plants of the gods, and especially in ancient Minoan uh, Greek and to a degree inherited or taken over by the Romans. Fossils rare, this is one that's found in the Rhone River in, in France uh, and dates to the 19th century. So places where we have what I thought of extraordinary finds, uh, in the middle of the 19th century, Gangora uh, heard about a discovery inside a bat cave where bats lived, the Cueva de Merced, Lagos in southern Spain, and they were digging and the excavators hit some bones and so they got scared and they called in the, uh, the boss and he hired uh, this well-to-do interested, there weren't professionals then uh, of archeology, span but had the um, finances to follow his passion that was to study the archeology span of Spain and, and inspired by the Swiss and the Germans, et cetera. So Gunger went in there and he carefully pulled back and here were five bodies in the center was the, the tallest a male with a gold diadem band around his head, and the other four, I believe, were women, if I remember, and all of them had little bolsitas, little bags, bolsas of spartagraphs that contained locks of hair, cowrie shells, and a poppy, and those are some of the fossils that were taken by Gangra and then later uh, analyzed and identified um, and published by a German uh, scientists. And that picture that I took here is in the limestone area, raised uh, cave infested uh, area of north of Nerja. So that's down not so far from Cordoba 
in the limestone mountains in the background, but near the coast. And then this cluster of dots up there is the uh, Swiss foreland sites, and these have been known for, uh, again, about a century, and the excavations there were early forms of archaeobotany uh, with a mistake of uh, uh, losing the time sequence in the extraction of the fossils in the early stages of this. So that's in the Swiss forelands uh, of the Alpine region, and there's a series of valleys and lakes there, and uh, when there's a severe drought, like the 100-year drought, the shoreline recedes and uh, exposes the shoreline. So people out there noticed that they hadn't seen, because it was always much higher and, and submerged, were these posts sticking up. And at first they thought, oh my goodness, and these posts were, you know, they were chopped off. The humans put those in there. I wonder who did that and why. And people, oh, they must have been uh, lake dwellers who built their houses out over the lake so they could defend themselves from other tribal groups or animals, etc. But the evidence found they were, uh, that they, in fact, were living on the shoreline, which became submerged again when the level came up. So they were there in, for only a short term until the climate changed and uh, the sea levels r rose. So it's about 500-year sections in the mo modern interpretation of what started to be found 170 years ago. But they believe that they were, uh, they were about 500 years, hunted and gathered, could see, find the bones of wild animals and wild plants, but also of cultivated plants like wheat and barley and rye especially, which is grown as a, gr uh, a grain in the higher elevations. It does better in c colder weather, whereas wheat and, and barley don't. And, uh, but also the poppies start to be found. And this is one of those lakes, a picture from a book published in the 19th century. And, uh, when the posts were found, they dug down to see how deep they went, if they could find anything, maybe looking for gold, et cetera. But in any case, they pumped out, and, uh, and in the interim, to have a look to, at the, but they didn't take cores carefully in those days, this is early uh, archaeobotany. And uh, this J man named Jacob Messencomer, and what he's doing, as you can see here, he's um, scooping off, when, it, when they stopped the pumping, the water seeped out through the uh, waterlogged area that had been exposed by the drought, and the things floated out from all different levels to the surface. So he collected the uh, fossils and well-preserved subfossils, and identified all the species were there. The problem was that they were all mixed up in the age because they came from the bottom of the top. And uh, he's sorting them out over here on the table, and among those are pop many poppy seeds and. Uh, one, at least one poppy capsule slightly uh, shrunken up. So were they using them just for food? Were they using them for medicine? Or were they also using a ritual? We don't know. But we now know that they were shore, uh, shore dwellers along the lakes. And many more sites have been found since uh, I did my research to try to bring all those sites together and, and make sense of uh, what started happening about 5,500 uh, years ago. Or, 50, or longer than that, up to maybe 7,000 years from today. Anyways, I want to take you to Greece, and uh, there's many representations of the opium poppy and myths about that associate the Hellenistic or the Greek culture. But at the end of the previous culture, uh, an eruption that may have been Thera or what have you, uh, destroyed the Minoan civilization. At the very end of that period, at least in the times, there was uh, representations of a cult that had developed across the islands, at least two major islands in the eastern Mediterranean. That's Crete, where this was found. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. So you see two views of this. The poppies, quote unquote, that are shown there, they're movable. They're removable. <laughs> and why was that the case in this, under the trance condition of the uh, somniferous poppy use, we, uh, Associate. Now, wh where were they found, and what was the paraphernalia? They're found in a, what I call subterranean um, deprivation chamber, in other words, underground temple. Think Eleusis and the ceremonies there. There are many different cults that have developed. If not many, there were several significant ones, and the one at Eleusis is the most famous. But this is pre that, which lasted from about 1500 BC, when this is this date, all the way to when the uh, Christians took over and suppressed that cult in the beginning of the suppression of advanced shamanic or advanced uh, religious as well as 
uh, more simple rural religious beliefs. Meanwhile, what does that uh, piece of par um, paraphernalia do? This is a ceramic piece, uh, maybe five or six inches or taller where it shows cut off here, but it has a draft area. So if you burn some charcoal on the ground in your underground chamber, and then you put this piece over there that's hollow, and it, the, uh, but put a metal plate on the top of it, pour on some opium sap, and uh, the heat causes a rise, air is coming in that further keeps the charcoal going, and the heat is then directed up and heats the metal plate and uh, vaporizes the uh, uh, opium sap, which could then be uh, inhaled. How was it inhaled? Well, and th that was on the island of Crete. Now, if we go to Cyprus, in an underground deprivation chamber or temple, the similar situation without the vase was found, similar to the one in Crete, but um, not the goddess of Ghazi, not a, in the uh, religious symbolic uplifted hands mode. But there, what was unique there, besides the, the first pipe of smoking, oh dear, <laughs> um, getting excited here. So the s substance that was found on the hole here, how would this operate? You'd hold on to this side, turn it upside down, and you could inhale by sucking in on this short end of it here, and they have some diagrams, some of it's associated with religious uh, beliefs interpreted by the art historians of the interested in Cy uh, Cypriot, ancient Cyprus sites and the Minoan culture at the end of its phase. So these are carnelian, are they poppy capsules? They sure look like it. Do they, like the doctrine of signatures, afford power in their, just their symbolic shape? But this was found in this situation where apparently uh, opium sap uh, was being taken under a perhaps ritual conditions. And we just mentioned the Eleusinian mysteries. We can go on and on about that. I thought maybe the, that the opium poppy was involved. Yes, we have the uh, Hoffman and, and Ruck, et cetera, um, theory that it was, uh, you know, a fungus and uh, that the uh, air gene or uh, lysergic acid contained in the fungus were carefully uh, siphoned the ones that were soluble and insoluble, and you could make this exciting brew. Well, if you were under the influence in the coming down phase, if you will, maybe opium was smoked to relax everything, and they sleep under having this once-in-your-lifetime experience. Uh, at least once in your life, you should go in the Greek realm. And then when the Romans took over, even the Romans would go to this temple. It lasted for almost 2,000 years, the use of the Eleusinian mysteries in Eleusis, the town, which you walked, after you fasted, you walked several miles to get there and you were, people with their heads covered so you couldn't tell, were yelling things about, you're, you're nothing, you, you, your ego essentially was saying, and creating the set and the setting after walking, tiring you out, and then you go into this great drama play of, I believe, the, and others, the agricultural myth of Demeter and the goddess of the underworld and other gods as, as well. So the use medicinally is probably manifested in, in what was arguably uh, a long distance trade and that involved putting opium in these little uh, juglets only a few inches tall that uh, contained opium mixed with uh, honey and so forth and could serve as a uh, painkiller. And this is one, one of the burials in the same era, about roughly 1500 BC, along the Nile in the cities. This was being imported from Cyprus as a Sudafed or a, a uh, aspirin or uh, an Aleve or something like that. Only in those days, you got something that looked like those plastic limes or plastic oranges uh, to tell you what's in the substance. And this little boy image here has the powerful, maybe doctrine of signatures again, the carnelian poppies, and you can, the interpretation is this, the swollen or uh, distended uh, abdomen here indicates you probably died of bad, drinking bad water or polluted water, which was a problem of, uh, in those days. So, and, and in our days as well, in urban uh, areas that don't have good enough uh, sanitation. The myth of Demeter, and I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna just mention that she loses her daughter. She comes back, she's upset. 
she, it's going to stop agriculture. And uh, she eventually, her brother, one of her brothers, Zeus, finds out that, oh my God, she's not producing the agriculture. She's the goddess of what's our sustenance. And because her beautiful daughter, Persephone, has disappeared. But Zeus also hears that his brother, the god of the underworld, has stolen Persephone and is keeping her there. So he has a discussion with them, uh, release Demeter. This is all symbolic of the agricultural ecology of the ancient Mediterranean. And you get the spring when things are planted, growth during the summer, harvest, and then the winter sets in and death and then renewal again, this cycle of rebirth, which you associate also with the mental uh, birth, growth, death, rebirth. And uh, so Zeus talks with the brother, the brother makes a deal, and he lets Persephone return. But he's, she's going to come back after the harvest. In other words, it symbolizes the growth uh, in the agricultural through the spring and the summer, and then the darkness and cold. And so Hades gets to have the beautiful, it's, you know, these are the highest level of society at the, at the spiritual level, and there's incest and uh, problems. We have the same kind of stories you'd say among the Ali'i in Hawaii or the high level uh, of the English in intermarriage and uh, having problems with uh, inbreeding and so forth. In any case, some, a lot of this is symbolized in this m story, which is much more involved than I'm telling you, but it, it, this is an early part of the transported landscape. Did it come from the Near East? Which is often said, oh, the opium poppy comes from the Near East. Probably not. In my research and others that followed, uh, it, Western Mediterranean from a, another species. So it somehow gets picked up just as Dionysus was a latecomer. And the story is Zeus got his family together and said, um, I've got somebody I want to bring in. I want to, the Hawaiians call it Hanai. Bring him in as adopted into our group. Now listen, he's, this is, instead of, uh, this is maybe only 6,000 years ago in this story, and it's after the, the images of these gods are well developed. So it's a newcomer, and he says he brings something with him, wine. And so this is a story about the introduction of another crop that could have been like the opium poppy into the transported landscape of agriculture. And how did he say he's going to become part of us? He took Dionysus, Zeus did, and he grafted him to his leg. That's the story, and that's the metaphor of grape growing. So, um, meanwhile, Ceres, I'm going to fast forward so we can at least have a little pot. Um, in this. <laughs> but Demeter is shown in many and taken into Greece, uh, I'm sorry, into Rome and known as Ceres, Ceres. And that comes from cereal, the word Ceralia, and the connection with the grains. But miraculously coming up and not cultivated are the weeds, and that's a typical of the opium poppy. The tiny seeds get in there and infect or we could call our natural uh, adventitious plant that gets in there, Demeter. With Demeter. So I'm going to move on just to uh, touch base with the part of my presentation. Sorry, for, this always happens with me. Too many stories, too much time <laughs> gathering information. Cannabis is the plant of the gods. Well, there's, that's what the type specimen in the Linnaean society uh, happened to be a member, thanks to Dick Schultes and the building I'm live in, no, my office, is St. John Building, a UH campus. That's the person who seconded. That's just a little tidbit. I had to get that in there because I loved being inducted with Darwin, the original painting of Darwin in old age. I'm going to grow a long gray beard and join the group. Anyways, there is Schultes in my favorite picture. This version was given to me by his son. And uh, yes, <coughs> there's difficulties is that one species is more than one species. It's multipurpose. It probably goes back, in my estimation, to Paleolithic times. People have to have water as we moved into the deserts, go to the streams like all the other, many of the other animals that have to get their water from the stream, the predators, the prey species, and that's where we lived. That's where we could settle down and fish. Think of, of multipurpose cannabis. Uh, fiber for clothing, for rope, for nets, for fish lines. The seeds, Excellent chum for catching fish. You want to have some um, omega-3s, you eat fish. And guess what's in the seeds of cannabis? Omega-3s. And so I think there's a, there's a pet theory I have that they're co-evolved because, yes, they would be d crunched up in most of them, but some of the harder acines would allow the seeds to go through, and then moves it around, helps disperse along with the streams. So these are the interconnections. You have a plant that offers you fiber, fuel when they dry out, and 
a whole host of other things, including psychoactivity. When that was actually selected for and enhanced, like so many breeders doing today, uh, we don't know. But um, rather than, at least I want to tell you about the newest find. Um, it's a multipurpose plants, and that's one of my main interests in ethnobotany, because I think they, it may not be accurate, but the more uses, the longer it's been around for humans to discover those uses, especially if they're long-term traditional uses. My favorite plant is not cannabis, not the opium poppy, and uh, let's leave mushrooms out for now, but it is the tea plant, Cordylin fruticosa, which has a huge root, and I live in a place called Kaimu Ki, which is the first suburb of Honolulu. That means Kaimu Ki, of the tea plant, Ki. And that was people would come together and do what could be done in an earth oven at home if there's a famine, and cook that up for a long period of time, and you get a super rich, you know, um, uh, sugary substance. And that was where festivals held yearly, still in some places they do that same, to remind them of when you have a hurricane or a fire or a war. In any case, those traditional uses are there. I want to tell you about the new finding the Palmyra Mo Mountains. Uh, and that was just a few years ago, because I got called as somebody not involved with the research, but quote unquote expert, to talk. Does this make sense to you? So at this cemetery, uh, it's a couple thousand years old. We'll leave it at that date right now, because that may fluctuate. What's interesting is the strips of black rocks and white rocks, maybe uh, uh, 20, 30 meters long, roughly, in alternate, so it's almost like a, a flag or something, and that's unusual, hadn't found that before. When they, about a third to a half of the burials had sh uh, short sections of trees dug out because they're soft wood, and then hot stones put in there, and then cannabis put over it. They know that because they analyzed substances off the stones in this high, dry area of the Palmers at about 16,000 feet, the lower latitude, so it's, it's cold in the winter, but it's warm enough in the summer. And this is the burial, maybe for that BMAC culture, one of the burial places. What they found, though, was this uh, THC, but not only in low amounts, in high amounts. So it was artificially selected, and that is uh, considered, I consider in others, the smoking gun. They, that's their position that it actually shows active burning of a highly, uh, potentially, uh, mind-manifesting uh, or hallucinogen level perhaps, or certainly psychoactive. And finally, the one I got to see uh, that was 1996 published, a shaman in one of the desert oasis cemeteries, and uh, I got to see the actual substance was taken out of a bag next to his head, and they think he was a shaman, the man that was buried there based on uh, musical instruments and other things. So this bag had 0.8 kilograms, about two pounds of chopped up inflorescence, the bracts, the short leaf-like looking modified bracts with all the trichomes on it, and chopped up like it came from the uh, Emerald Empire in uh, Northern California or something that was sold in bags. It was still green. It was 2,500 years old. It was brought out in, a, in vitro in a glass case, and the uh, attendants with the gloves said, no pictures, and my colleague uh, Jiang said, yeah, no pictures, but you get to see it. I tried to smell it. I, and my smell isn't that good, but it was unreal. Same silk conference that I was at when we got to go in the museum, finishing up. They pulled on these two local archaeologists that had discovered something new in the burial. They had it there for a while. They were waiting for the conference to show and let the world know about it. And so we went. I didn't actually get into the burial, but I saw it on a big screen and then got to see the cannabis that was brought out. This man was buried about 2,500 years ago, and he had 30... No, 13 uh, stems of cannabis. They're only about a, uh, less than a meter high, and they were bunched together like a bouquet and put on the right side and spread out over his body. The prototype of the burial shroud that a, a, a Chinese person who's told he's got to wear or she's got to wear because their um, relative died, the hemp shroud that's worn in Korea, in China, a uh, tra traditional shroud, and even shrouds in Eastern Europe that are important. The burial shroud, even one in France that was found. And so this might have been the prototype of the burial shroud. There were still little fragments of the uh, cannabis left on it that we used for the identification along with the stems analyzed, but all the tops were cut off. It sounds like it's today, you know, cut off the, pull off the stuff and have it all 
the energy, more or less, as much as possible, going to developing the inflorescence up at the top, which easily be harvested and perhaps artificially selected. And finally, that uh, thank you very much to Dennis and the others that put this on and the people sharing all of your knowledge and history. Um, I could go on and on, but uh, I'm not. And thank you for not. <laughs> Aloha. I always go on a little longer so that nobody can ask any questions. Thank you, Dr. Merlin. Does anybody have any questions? Coming up front. I, I am just wondering about the, the dating of this uh, Chinese excavation of cannabis. Uh, my memory is uh, faulty, but I thought that they had uh, pushed back the date of that, uh, as I seem to recall, maybe I me dreamed it or made it up, that, that they had pushed back the date to around 10,000 years ago. Am I wrong uh, about I that? Might have been, you may have read me. <laughs> no. Doc, um, Rob Clark and I wrote a book for U University of California Press, Cannabis, Evolution, and Ethnobotany. But what I discovered, I was doing, he's doing most of the botanical, I'm doing most of the historical, and we, of course, intertwine. I found that there was a landslide south of Tokyo on the Bozo Peninsula, and uh, it covered the road, so they had to push the stuff back, and the engineers and, and construction workers were cleaning up the mess so the road could be open. They found little pieces of pottery. And that pottery is found, so they brought in the uh, archaeologists and they stopped and then took samples and so forth. These were fragments of Joman pottery. Joman is the original, hunters and gatherers came when there was a land bridge from the south and the north, Okinawa, or in, in the south, uh, Okinawans in the north, we have the Hokkaido peoples. They still have some of the Ainu peoples. Those are different tribes originally of the Joman culture. And that's named after pots that have woven material to make an imprint on it. When the, the, the potsherds were found, that was a big finding, and then they looked in the potsherds, they were stuck to the potsherds, the bottom parts, and even perhaps the sides, were cannabis seeds. And so these were been stuck to the pots, and so the pots were used, among other things, to store cannabis seeds. Cannabis is one of the first plants among these people that were being, not in the Mesolithic type of culture, not maybe completely cultivated, because they're adventitious, but then you carefully tend them, and there's about three plants, drug and oil plants. Carl Sauer suggested maybe the first plants that were ever domesticated were oil, po food, uh, fish poisons, and so forth. Those were dated somewhere between about 11,000, you know, a, a big uh, bell-shaped curve. The dates that we used at about 10,000 to average it out. It might be younger, but it looked solid with the number of uh, the, um, you know, the statistical probability with the number of samples. So that's all the way in Japan. I'm not saying to argue that's the origin area, but um, definite information tied to written materials goes back 5,000 years. But it's much earlier than that, I think. This thing was carried by people. I mean, very close to where the Iceman, he didn't have any of his packet, was a discovery of, uh, in the, that zone which I talked about, the Swiss foreland. We come around to Italy, they have a number of sites. As archaeology develops, more intensely in Japan was advanced. Now China has got tremendous development of archaeology and they're finding all kinds of things. Everybody knows about the whole army and so forth, but right. lots of archaeobotany and that's where the 10,000 year date comes from. But we'll see if we can find, we have, telling fibers apart from other fibrous species is, is difficult, but we have examples uh, even in the Caucasus of fibers going back 25, 30,000 years, even with the color pink along with other dyes. So um, ethnobotany goes back into the Paleolithic. And that's what really interests me is what are these first plants that were used and, and even if they weren't carried around by seed, uh, they were the memory of those plants and that's what I tried to address at Paul's uh, point that we lose this energy, uh, information. We may be losing it now but we, it needs to be carried on or at least symbolic and that is for our quest for finding that plant that satisfies our communication with our ancestors all the way into the Pacific. Kava is not found native beyond remote Oceania, which means you had to sail there, so it's only within the last 3,500 years there. But that's the oldest date. You see how I can segue into further lecturing or talking to myself. 
I hope I answered that. One more Good. question here. Thank you so much. Thank you. So given your expertise and wide reading on all this, what is your best guess about the Eleusinian Mysteries? I mean, this, the Eleusinian Mysteries? Yeah, not, you don't have to, it's nothing publishable, but just like, what's your, what's your gut instinct? The what first drama, can you imagine going in there and you're already prepared? I showed the, uh, and I skipped right over it somehow, A plus B and C plus B plus C, sorry, I finally got to it, A plus B plus C equals X, the experience. And it's obviously the quality and the quantity of the drug and then the set and the setting. You create that setting and what was used was something that got the out-of-body out of experience and perhaps the disassociation because that's the, the story was about Persephone being taken away and that's symbolic of our recycling, this cyclical year. Obviously, these were farming people, so they, like the Hawaiians, they're based on the lunar calendar. This is based on a calendar of seasons and so forth. But um, you know, you've seen a mystery, who knows what was in that substance, but uh, interesting that Hoffman was the one that showed that, that some of the alkaloids uh, are soluble in the, uh, related to the fungus, which uh, remind me of the name of the fungus. It grows, Clavice. Clavice, Claviceps purpurea, and it grows when you have a, a, a summer rain, and then flourishing with enough rain, the fungus can grow. So that's why the outbreaks around Europe and probably, possibly, it didn't help explain all of the Salem witch uh, theory, but he had famine set out where people get St. Anthony's disease and feel like they're, because they have the toxic alkaloids in the claviceps. But Hoffman's experiments showed that you could filter out. I always wondered, but boy, you'd have to be pretty careful. You know, maybe you wouldn't, some of these would slip out, you know, jiggle the thing or whatever, but the psychoactive mind manifesting alkaloids would uh, be soluble and then you'd have the drink. And they called it Kiki on drink and you couldn't say it or, or possibly uh, being put to death. So there's a secrecy among that. And it was Aristophanes who wrote, you know, the birds, and he made fun of these people going, you know, and going down to the, Ruck has done a wonderful job of recreating that. So we don't really know the kiki on drink, that could be the beer to put this, this substance in to make it more palliable, or it was actually a, a barley drink, so it may not have been uh, fermented and so forth. But you can read all about it in the literature. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Aloha. Shaka. Okay, so we're going to continue with Elaine Elizabethsky. We can take a very brief restroom break, and we'll be starting within five minutes. Thank you. Ah. Uh. 